All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, looks like we have some folks watching, which is awesome. Um, so I, I figure it's, it's one o'clock, so we might as well jump right into this because I have relatively ambitious goals for this workshop, for this boot camp. Um, but I thought I'd start and talk a little bit about you know, who I am and why I decided I wanted to do something like this. Um, so if you don't know who I am, my name is Paul Viertaler. I am an assistant professor at William & Mary of Chinese Studies, uh, but this is not in my capacity as a professor there. Um, rather, it's something that I want to do because people often ask me where they can kind of get started in programming for the digital humanities and where can they start working on their own projects, either as a graduate student, as an undergraduate, or even as a faculty member. Um, I spent three years teaching at Leiden University in the Netherlands, where I taught the digital humanities. And a lot of my focus there was on teaching um, programming and teaching text analysis. And please forgive me, this is the first time I've ever tried something like this. So uh, I'll probably talk quickly until my nerves settle down a little bit. It's always those um, first day of teaching jitters. This is a little bit different than teaching on Zoom, I think. Um, but yeah, so people will often kind of ask me, you know, what do we do? How do we get started? And often you find, particularly in Chinese studies, that people are very, very excited about this, but it's not always super clear what to do. And that's not necessarily because there are a lack of materials that you can use to learn how to do these sorts of things. In fact, right now we're living in a time where there is a really remarkable number of things you can use to learn you know, either general programming or programming specifically for doing humanities data analysis, for doing natural language processing, and all of these sorts of things. So I'm going to try to keep an eye on chat. If you have any questions, uh, just put them there and I'll try to answer them. Um, so uh, I have my notes here just to make sure I don't miss anything. So. This is going to be a live stream in which we're going to start from the very, very basic things you need to know to write a script that will do a little bit of pretty basic text analysis. So we're going to be talking about the software you're going to need, which I have posted on GitHub, and hopefully you've seen that link. Um, if not, I'll actually just go ahead and post it in the chat right now so you can check it out. Um, go there. And so you can go there and we'll walk through all of the steps, of course, um, but you can kind of see what we're going to be doing there in terms of software installations. Then we'll talk about how to use the command line. We'll talk about not everything you can do with it, but we'll talk about kind of navigating your system. We'll talk about running Python scripts and doing basic file manipulation, mostly focused on creating and deleting files. Um, now, let's see. I am going to try to make this workshop a balance between covering things that are useful to know and trying to avoid g getting too wild. Sorry, I just bumped my mic there. Um, because it's very easy to quickly let things get out of hand and try to cover just far, far too much material. So this isn't necessarily going to be a workshop that you can do and then go out and get a job as a developer but it will hopefully give you the skills that you'll need to do a little bit of research to kind of get excited about the sort of things that are possible. Now, I will be posting all of the code that I'm going to write as part of this workshop onto this GitHub page. And from there, you can download it, you can play around with it yourself, or you can simply just follow along. Um, if you're impatient, of course, there are a lot of other resources out there that will cover a lot of the same materials. In fact, I have videos on this YouTube channel that cover a lot of these materials, but some of those were made three years ago, which does, uh, these things do go out of date relatively quickly. Of course, there are a lot of other YouTube channels for these sorts of things. And if you're specifically interested in uh, DH for uh the humanities, I really, really encourage you to check out a few other resources. I'm going to switch it over here so you can see my browser here. Um, 
and I have my GitHub page pulled up. But if you haven't seen it yet, I really, really encourage you to go check out Melanie Walsh's new textbook on Python and cultural analytics. It's really spectacularly well done and it'll cover a large amount of the same things that I'm gonna be covering in, in this series. In fact, it's gonna go a lot further than I will because I just don't have the time to, to cover all of this, but it's a very, very good resor uh, resource. What I'm gonna be covering is essentially everything you would need to know to get started in my digital humanities lab. So um, I want people to be able to watch this and kind of be able to jump straight in. So for beginners, um, this is a really good place to go. Um, and I will go ahead and share the link. Thank you uh, for the suggestion. Um, if once you kind of get a little bit more of a handle on the basics of programming and the basics of the sorts of things you can do, another really good place to go that a book that just came out um, six days ago now uh, is Humanities Data Analysis by Mike Kestemont, Fulger Karstorp, and Alan Riddle. Um, this is a little bit more advanced. I think uh, they probably expect you to be intermediate. So you have a good sense of Python syntax and how you can approach um, the sorts of questions that people in the humanities are interested in asking. And I'll post a link to that in the chat as well. Um, and another good resource, if you're not necessarily into Python, but you're more into R. Um, there are a lot of good resources out there for you as well. Um, and a classic in this vein is Humanities Data in R, in R by Taylor Arnold and Lauren Tilton. Um, and this is a really nice uh, approach because it also talks about not just text analysis, but networks, uh, geospatial analysis, image, a lot of really cool stuff. So if you haven't seen this either, um, go check it out. There's a lot of good stuff in that. Uh, and I do want to point out one of my favorite uh, coding training YouTubers uh, is Daniel Schiffman. Uh, he has this channel, uh, The Coding Train. And I actually just today realized he has 1.2 million viewer, uh, subscribers, which is just incredible. I think he was around 100,000 when I started following him, uh, which is still a big channel. And he just really works through all of the details of using programming and for him for understanding the natural world. So he does a lot of physics simulations, a lot of animations. It's a really good resource if you want to, to think beyond just what we can do in the humanities. Um, if you want to do this professionally or if you just kind of are curious about things you can do creatively. Uh, this is a really good option. He has a lot of really, really great videos. So there are, I think, a few kind of open questions you might have if you don't have any familiarity with um, programming for the humanities. And one question that I get a lot is why Python specifically? And because there are other really good options. When I first started programming, I was working with Ruby. And from Ruby, I went to R. And then from R, I went to Python. And I kind of stuck in Python for most of what I do. Um, and where, where you end up landing really is up to you. And it, it kind of depends on what you're most interested in. Python's nice because it has a very large community of data scientists. It has a big community of people in the humanities that work with it. Um, these resources, like this uh, textbook by Melanie Walsh, is a great resource. Um, you know, all these other textbooks are wonderful, uh, but R is another really good place. Um, if you're interested in doing a little bit more low-level work and some of the problems you're working on, if they're too computationally intensive for Python, sometimes stepping to something like C is a good option. But Python is a nice place for beginners to start because the syntax is relatively transparent and it's relatively easy to learn. Now, in this workshop, I'm going to be working with the Anaconda distribution of Python. Um, and I use Anaconda because it comes with a lot of extra materials that makes teaching digital humanities, that makes teaching data science much simpler than just trying to put together something one piece at a time. And this is 
just a collection of a lot of data science libraries that that we won't be using so much in this series, but that you will find hopefully quite useful as you you know set off on this adventure. So, and it's of course op open source and it's free. Uh, they do have uh, enterprise versions, which I think have support and you can use if you do this professionally in a commercial setting, but it is something that, um, that you can, can use. And it also comes with extra things like um, uh, integrated development environments and plain text editors, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. But I really like Anaconda. Uh, if you prefer not to have such a large install on your computer, I definitely get that as well. Um, and there you can just go to Python and download the most recent version of it directly from there. Because I, I think Anaconda right now is on Python version 3.8, and the broader Python is a little bit later than that. I think it's 3.9 at this point. So it's really your call. Um, but if you're following along, I encourage you to go to anaconda.com, and I'll post this link here. It is uh, linked from GitHub, but I'll go ahead and put this here. And if you don't already have this installed, go ahead and just install it with the default options. Um, there are there are lots of ways you can install this, but this is relatively simple um, because they have an easy graphical installer. If you scroll down to the bottom of that page, if you're on a Windows machine, you can download either the 64-bit or the 32-bit installer. Uh, if you're on Windows 10, you should definitely be doing the 64-bit version. Um, but you know, if you're still using Windows 7, maybe you're on a 32-bit distribution, you can do that. Um, but if you're on a Mac, you can just, I would suggest doing the graphical installer. And if you're on Linux, also um, the x86 installer. Um, most of this workshop will be geared at people who are working either with Macs or with Windows. So I'm streaming from a Windows computer, but I do have my Mac setup to be captured so I can show you some of the differences that we're going to encounter when we start to learn how to use the command line, because that's where most of the difference is going to be. Um, what else? What else is important to know before we get started? Um, one thing that is also worth thinking about is, is it even worth learning to program to do digital humanities work or to do text analysis? Because really, it's not necessary. Uh, there are lots and lots of tools that are out there that will let you do very good work without ever needing to learn how to program. Um, the most famous, I think, tool in the digital humanities in text analysis is Voyant Tools, and it's really spectacular. It does, I mean, everything that we're going to learn how to do in this workshop, you could do with Voyant Tools. Um, it even has, I think, functionality these days to work with languages like Chinese and Japanese and Arabic, which is great. And we will, as part of this workshop, talk a little bit about doing analysis in languages that aren't English. Um, because like I say, my, my PhD is in Chinese literature. Uh, I'm very interested in how we can use these tools to explore Chinese historical texts and literary texts. And so a lot of times you'll run into things that uh, there are affordances that you need to consider when you want to do analysis in a language that's not English, and we'll talk about those. Um, but one advantage of learning how to do this yourself and learning how to program is that this really puts you in the driver's seat for the kinds of analysis that you can do. Um, in many cases, as soon as you start to step slightly outside of what a pre-made tool wants you to do with it, things get very, very complicated very, very quickly. And if you have a good grasp on how to program in Python, in JavaScript, in R, in Ruby, whatever, you have a lot more options. You can really go in whatever direction most appeals to you. And that, that to me, is really one of the most exciting things about learning how to program, because you're not constrained to what other people have done in the past. And it opens a lot of really interesting doors. That being said, there are disadvantages. Uh, one of the really big disadvantages is simply that there's a steep learning curve. Um, you'll probably find, if you follow along in the, in the coding that we do here, it's very easy to 
make a typo. And when you make a typo, sometimes those are very difficult to spot. One issue that I used to have a lot, fortunately the environments have gotten better, is if I'm typing something in Chinese and I then kind of go and start to do some programming, sometimes those commas and those periods and the colons look almost identical to ASCII characters, but they aren't. And the Python interpreter gets very confused and gives you a syntax error that you actually can't see. And so that's one of these things that tends to be quite frustrating when you first get started. Uh, so just be aware of that. Be, be kind of careful and do know that this will take some practice. Uh, it's, you know, we're going to be moving pretty quickly in this uh, workshop series. And review is always your friend and practice is always your friend. Another big danger is there's always the temptation to reinvent the wheel. Um, as I said, you know, if you just want to do some basic collocation analysis or some quick data visualizations, there are, there are lots of tools out there that will let you do this. Voyant tools, AntConc, all sorts of really, really great stuff that professional developers have made and have optimized for your use. And those are, those are really good options, and I would encourage you to use those until you no longer until you start to feel kind of, I don't know, chained down into what they're trying to do. Um, and I find very quickly I run into a wall based on what I'm trying to do that I need to develop something myself, right? Um, another issue is it's very easy to introduce accidental bugs or mistakes in your analysis. And this is just where you kind of have to be careful uh, working with somebody else and showing them your code and them showing you what they're working on is a very very useful thing to do. It's a, it's a, it's a good habit to get into. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here is that as we go through this, I will be putting up all of these resources on that GitHub site that I've shared. Um, and I am leaving what we will be covering a little bit flexible. Uh, and this kind of will depend on how much time we have. Um, I know for a lot of you, you're all very busy people. And, um, you know, I'm getting back into the swing of a semester coming up in the next week where I'm having lots of meetings. So, for example, today I definitely have to end right at 3. Uh, maybe we'll finish up a little earlier than that. I don't know. But depending on how much time we have, that'll change a little bit exactly what we cover. But I do plan to stream every day this week from 1 to 3, and we'll just see kind of what we get through. Um, I plan to cover materials for maybe the first hour of the stream and then just hang out and answer any questions that folks might have for the second half of it, uh, assuming there are, of course, viewers and there are questions. If there aren't questions, I might, you know, keep going and see what we can cover. Now, today, I hope to actually get into a little bit of super basic Python syntax. Um, I don't know if we'll have time because we're going to be covering the command prompt and then programming. And there will be differences depending on what kind of a computer you're using. So overall, we'll cover terminal and the command prompt, basic Python syntax, and extremely basic text analysis. And like I say, we'll talk about different languages as well. So uh, as far as software uh, installation goes, as I mentioned, I hope that everybody goes ahead and installs Anaconda, uh, because this is a really useful um, set of tools that you can use to, to do this, right? Um, this, you'll see when you're on um, Anaconda's website now, they don't actually have a Python 2 option anymore. Uh, this is a little bit different than it was even a couple of years ago, where people were still using Python 2. Um, use Python 3. Python 2 is not getting any updates anymore. It is a security risk at this point, and it handles strings in a different way than Python 3. Python 3 is much, much better for anyone who works with languages that are extended beyond your standard 128 ASCII character set. So, you know, if you work in, in Russian, if you need to use Cyrillic text or in Arabic or Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, any really any language that goes beyond your standard Latin alphabet, you really want to be working with Python 3 because you don't want to get stuck in a place where you're dealing with character encoding issues, which was really the bane of everybody's existence in 2011, 
right? So things are quite a bit better now because we're using Python 3.8. So if you haven't done so, please do install this. It is a relatively large install. It might take a little while. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that you have done so. And let me close this. And um, once you have installed this, um, what I then want you to do is to go ahead and open it up. Now, how you do this will be slightly different on Windows and on Mac computers. I'm going to show you my desktop here. Um, if you're on a Windows machine, uh, you can click on your start bar or your Windows bar, as I think it's called now, and you can search for the Anaconda, and, oops, Anaconda Navigator. And go ahead and open up the Navigator. And on a Mac machine, it's going to be pretty similar. Uh, and here's where we see if my situation is set up. And it'll take a moment to kind of load up. But I'll it looks like it's loading here. Let's switch over to my Mac. OK. Um, on your Mac, it should just be in your Applications folder, under also under Anaconda Navigator. And so just open it up, and it will open up a menu. And on that menu, you're going to have quite a few different options. And let me come back to my Windows computer here. And we'll show desktop. Let's see. OK, so if you're on a Windows machine, once you've installed Anaconda and opened up the Anaconda Navigator, you're going to get a window that looks a lot like this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. There are a lot of things happening here, but there are only a few things that matter for our purposes. Um, we're going to be writing Python uh, using a plain text editor. Now, a lot of people who teach these things approach this in different ways. My personal preference is for plain text simply because when I use something that is a little fancier than that, I tend to kind of forget the state that my code's in, and it's very easy for me to get mixed up. So we're just going to be doing pure plain text Python files. And for that, you will need to install a plain text editor. Now. Which one you install is entirely up to you. I personally really like VS Code. And the nice thing is, is that it is bundled in with Anaconda Navigator. And if you don't have it installed, rather than having a launch button, you'll have an install button. So I encourage you to go ahead and do that. There are other options. Um, a lot of people use Jupyter Notebooks when they're um, teaching how to code. And they're really great because you can write out natural language uh, information, and then you can have code blocks interspersed between these different uh, natural language descriptions or explanations. And you can run each code block individually, and it will remember the current state of those code blocks. And that's where I get a little bit um, thrown off base. But it's a really, really good resource, and you're welcome to use those. Do note that those use a, a server to kind of process and serve the information. So there's a little bit extra overhead compared with just writing these plain text files and running them from your command prompt. Uh, there are also flow, uh, full blown IDEs or integrated development environments that are packaged with Anaconda that you're welcome to use. Um, Spider, for example, uh, here is a good one. Uh, the advantage of an IDE is, is that it will really hold your hand, and it'll try to help you debug things. It'll try to make sure that you just don't get easily lost. Um, I prefer uh, slightly simpler things, but that that's, again, up to you. RStudio is another good option that actually, in spite of being called RStudio because it was originally meant for R, also has a Python extension. So you can use RStudio for Python. Um, but like I say, I really prefer using VS Code. And um, you're welcome to do that. There are also things like uh, Sublime Text, Notepad++, Atom, BB Edit. Or if you're really old school, you can use Vim or Emacs or any of those sorts of things. But um, like I say, I'll be using VS Code here. Now, because we are running or writing these, these scripts just 
in plain text. And, and by plain text, I, that just means that these are files that don't have extra markup that tell your computer how to display them to you, right? Like a, a Word document is actually a, an XML file that has a lot of extra markup that kind of says, okay, well, this is the font we're using, this is the heading, this is the structure of the document. Plain text doesn't really have any of that. Um, and so once you've installed that, you can launch that. And so uh, I already actually have this open, um, and I have something that I'm calling demo script here. Let me switch this here. Um, it might open up into a welcome window for you, and then you're going to start, you know, typing code, right? Uh, but we're not we're not there yet. Um, the next thing we need to kind of familiarize ourselves with is the command line. And this is where we're going to start to get a little bit technical. I've already been talking for 26 minutes, kind of giving you some background and the plan of what we're doing. But one thing to note is, is that if you're using plain text like we are here, and I, let's say I minimize this, and I'll go ahead and close this and all of this. And we have my desktop here, and I have... Um, well, let me just save a file here. So this is demo script, demo script one. Yeah. And so I have multiple monitors up here and I'm not seeing this. So I'm just going to go into my file browser, into my desktop. And apparently I haven't saved it. So let's just do it like this. I'll save as um, demo script one dot py. Save. Yes. Okay. So if I want to run this file, which now is right here on my desktop, if I double click it, Windows doesn't know. Um, Windows doesn't know that this is a Python file. Okay, um, somebody says they're running on a Mac and they don't see VS Code. Um, so I'll go ahead really quickly. Um, so on your Anaconda Navigator, if you're in Home, and you should see something that looks kind of like this. Um, if you scroll down, there should be VS Code right here. Um, but if you're still not seeing it, uh, you can also Google it, and you'll find it really quickly. Um, and it, it's a pretty quick install. It's not super heavy, so hopefully um, that will uh, that will be fine. You can also install one of these other programs if you prefer, Spider and R Studio are fine, although they are a little bit more complex to use than VS Code is. Um, but hopefully others are not running into that issue. And you know, you can also use like Sublime Text, which is another really great, um, is a really great piece of software to use. But um, hopefully everybody can catch up. And there's also, um, well, there'll, there'll be plenty of time for questions as we get a little bit further into this as well. So anyway, um, note that my computer doesn't know to execute this file. It just knows that it's a Python file. It associates it with VS Code, and it opens it up, and it lets me type things where I can type something like hello. Right? So this is technically a fully functional Python script. Um, OK, so not everybody is seeing VS Code. So uh, but yeah, Spider will work. Um, otherwise, you can just go to, let's see, VS Code um, from here. Oops. I'll go ahead and stick this in the chat there. Uh, and so you can go from there. Uh, that should be a good option. All right. So let's see. What we're going to need to do. Uh, assuming everybody's able to uh, follow along. Um, we actually need to tell our computers that these are files we actually want to execute, not just open up and type in, right? So this does mean that we're going to need to learn how to use the terminal. But actually, this is a very good thing you should know how to use anyway. Um, because what the terminal will let you do is it will let you interact with your computer on perhaps a lower level than, than you're used to, right? Um, you can run commands that will let you rename files in bulk. 
You can delete files, create them. Um, you can run utilities to diagnose, you know, all sorts of things, right? So it's a very good thing to know how to use. Um, but there are nuances between using the command line on a Mac versus on a Windows machine. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, there are a few different options, but the easiest thing to do is to go into the Anaconda Navigator, and there should be a cmd.exe prompt. This is only for folks on Windows computers. And this is just your, commuter, uh, your computer's command prompt, but it knows where, Python, or where Anaconda is installed. And this is one of the reasons why I like Anaconda, because we don't really need to get into telling our Windows machines. Uh, we don't need to set environment variables and all of these sorts of things, which kind of makes getting started all the more complex. But if you launch your command prompt, it will just open up your Windows system command prompt and it'll be in your home folder on your computer and it will know where Anaconda is living. So, so that is a very, very useful thing to know about. And you can pin it to your taskbar, which makes it easier to get to in the future. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can just search for Anaconda prompt and this will also get you there. And in fact, this is what I use to run all of my scripts on my Windows computer. Now, if you're on a Mac, it is a little bit different. Um, if you're already in your applications file, there will be a folder on your Mac called utilities. And inside this utilities folder, you will have your terminal.app. And this is the terminal that you'll be using to interact with your computer. If you double click it, it'll open it up. Um, I have mine set up visually to be a little bit more like the Windows command prompt or a Linux command prompt with white text on a black background. But by default, I think the Mac uh, terminal is in fact, um, it's black text on a white background. But you, it, you're in the same place. So that will be a good option for you. And I'm gonna make this larger um, just so when we come back, you can see what we're trying to do. Um, okay, so this is perhaps at a lower level than you've ever interacted with your computer. Uh, if you've been using computers for a long time, this might feel like getting in a time machine and going back to the early 90s when you know we're all using MS-DOS and those sorts of things. Uh, but if you haven't seen this before, Basically, what this is is a place that you can type in commands to interact with your computer, right? Now, by default, you'll be you'll use, usually have all of your own user accounts permissions. Um, so sometimes if you want to interact with the system itself, you're going to need higher level permissions. We'll talk a little bit about that going forward, but we don't need to know too much about that right now. Um, when you first open up your terminal, it will have you in your home folder. And on a Mac, your home folder is represented by this little tilde here. Um, and in many cases, it's not clear where in your file system you are. And sometimes you want to, um, you want to see where you are, in fact. Uh, you can actually type pwd, which is print working directory, and it'll basically tell you where you are in your system. On a Windows computer, um, it is a little bit different. On a Windows machine, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to type CD, and that will say it will give you your current working directory. So that is where on your in your system are you? So if you're using your file explorer on a Windows machine, this is basically just setting you down in your users folder um, under your, you know, under your user, right? So this this file explorer, which you can't see, let me show you my desktop. Uh, so this file explorer is just in my on my C drive in my users folder under my username, right? So this is the same sort of place. Um, on my other computer, on the Mac, 
it's going to be relatively similar. But basically, we can tell our computer where in our file system we want to be using a file path. So here you see C colon. This is the drive that I'm on. This is just for Windows computers. If I want to go to a different drive, I can, for exa example, say D colon, and it will go to my D drive if you happen to have a D drive. Um, the backslash specifies folders on a Windows machine. So uh, there's a folder on my computer called users, and inside that folder is another folder called uh, V-I-E-R-T. And you'll have probably the first five letters of your username on your computer. Um, Macs are slightly different in that Macs use, rather than backslashes, they use forward slashes. So here we have my folder users and my folder Paul Viertaler, and these are separated with forward slashes rather than backslashes. Now, this is going to be one of those things that you're going to have to take into account when you try to write scripts that will run both on Macs and on Windows machines. So we will make sure that everything we write will be compatible across different systems. Um, but this is one of those small little nuances that are different between the two computers. So let's kind of dive in and take a look at some useful commands in the terminal. So let me jump. Oh, and, and thanks um, for, yeah, for the help. So if other folks are having any issues with um, the, the Visual Studio, go ahead and download it, open the zip, copy it to your applications directory, and run it. Uh, great. And so then Anaconda sees it. Thank you so much for that. That's, that's awesome. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about actually interacting with the terminal. So here I am on my Windows computer. And as I mentioned, I can type CD, and it will just echo back at me where I am in my system. Now on Windows, generally, the first part of your line here is actually going to tell you where you are anyway. Uh, Macs are a little bit different, so this is a pretty, a, pr a pretty useful thing to know how to do. Um, so CD, just by itself, will give you back your location. On the Mac, again, it's PWD. That will give you your location. Often, you'll want to know what are the files that exist inside this folder. If you're using the command prompt on the Windows machine, all you need to do is you need to type DIR. So when you type DIR, it will just give you a list of all of the folders and files that exist inside this particular uh, directory or inside this folder. So inside my home folder, I just have a bunch of different files, a bunch of different folders. That's not um, too complicated. The command on a Mac is a little bit different, and this also works on a Linux computer. Uh, to list all the files, it's just ls. Um, so that is pretty simple. You can also clear off your screen by typing clear on a Mac, and that'll just clear everything off. So, so this is nice to kind of reset if your screen's starting to look a little bit messy. So Mac, that is clear. And then on Windows, the command is CLS. OK? So here, I'm going to put this in the chat so you can remember CD and print working directory shows you your directory. Um, dear slash LS. Uh, displays the content of the file of the directory. And then um, CLS slash clear clears the screen. OK? So these are um, super, super basic commands that you can use. Um, what else are we going to need to know how to do? OK. How do you actually move around your file system? Well, uh, you have a few options. You can use both relative paths and absolute paths. So let's say, for example, 
I want to go to my desktop on my Windows computer here. So there is a path, um, excuse me, the desktop folder is inside my home directory. And so what I can do, if I do the directory, we can see that desktop is right here inside this file. To go there, I simply say cd space desktop, desktop, okay? And when I hit enter, now we can see that I am in my desktop folder. And I can now check what is on this. And so here we see I have a couple different image files. I have a directory for Chinese text, French and English text. These are demo text we're gonna get into in analyzing later uh, in this workshop. But then what I can do is I can go into the English file, excuse me, English, and now I'm inside the English. And so we, here we see we have Adventures of Her Sherlock Holmes, Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, and Return of Sherlock Holmes. Now, to move backward in our file structure, I can simply say cd uh, period. And so that moves me, um, sorry, excuse me, cd dot dot. So cd dot dot keeps moving me back in my file structure. And I can actually go all the way back to the root of my file system, okay? Now, I can also give my computer absolute paths. That is, I don't need to say, I don't need to say cd slash, uh, let's go into users, and then cd into my user folder. I can actually say cd, c colon slash users slash, slash desktop slash English. And so what this is, is this is an absolute path that I can use to go from wherever I am in the system to this particular folder. And so now we can see I'm back in this English folder. Now, the reason I mention this is because let's say I am here in my user folder and I want to go into English. Um, if that English folder doesn't exist, it's not gonna know where to look. So I have to be very specific. Now, what's really nice about computers, uh, the terminal is there's something called tab autocomplete. So I can type a D and if I hit tab, it will cycle through all of my items that start with a D. And so I can keep hitting tab until I get to desktop, and then I can say uh, English and get back in there, tab out, it's pretty handy, okay? Um, it works pretty similarly on a Mac. Um, and so for example, here uh, I could say CD desktop, and I hit tab and it'll auto-complete and ls to see what exactly exists on this. Um, so, and you can see I just have some junk that's on my desktop here. So what else is useful? Um, so the process is pretty similar on a Mac, except instead of using those backslashes to indicate folders, you're going to use forward slashes, okay? Um, one thing to note, about this CD functionality on a Mac, if you just do CD with nothing else, rather than telling you where you are, it will return you to your home folder, which can be a pretty handy sort of thing to do. Now, sometimes you might wanna to go to your computer's root, and you can do that on a Mac by doing CD slash. That is just the deepest folder inside your system. And so I can, um, look at the files that exist here, and this is where my applications exist, my Anaconda dis distribution is, and a few other of these sorts of things, right? Um, on a Windows machine, it's pretty similar. Um, if I do cd backslash, it'll take me to my computer's root directory, okay? Um, but I wanna stick around in my home directory which unfortunately does not have a shorthand on a Windows computer. And I'm gonna do most of my work from the desktop here, okay? So I'm 
going to create a folder that I'm going to use for this workshop. This is where I'm going to save all of the scripts that I write, where I'm going to put the files we're going to analyze, and just make sure everything is centrally located. So what I'll do here is I'm going to use the command makdir, okay? This will make a directory and it'll name it whatever I tell it. So I'm just going to call this um, from 0 to n, okay? And so when I do that, it doesn't tell me anything. Uh, but when I say dir, now we can see that there is a directory called from 0 to n that didn't exist before. And if I show you my desktop and I minimize this and this and this, and this, uh, you can see that now there's a folder on my desktop uh, called from 0 to n. There is, uh, the process on a Mac is exactly the same. Make dir from 0 to n. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> oh, I'm in my root. That's why I don't have permission. Uh, make sure, you, if you try to create something in a place where your user doesn't have permission, it's going to tell you you can't do that. So I'm going to go to my desktop here on my Mac, and I'm going to say make dear, and I'm going to call it from 0 to n. There we go. And now you can see that that folder just popped right up. I've created a new folder. And it's an empty folder. There's really nothing in there. So what I want to do is I want to now just change directories into from 0 to n, because this is where I'm going to be doing um, uh, where I'm going to be doing the uh, the stuff for this class. Um, yeah, so to create a directory, it's make dear um, and then whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to say from zero to n, and I'll talk about how to make a file from the terminal as well. But I'm actually, generally speaking, not going to be uh, creating too many files from the command line. But it, it is, of course, quite possible. Um, so now that I have created this file, I can change directories into it, and we can start to work inside this file. Um, but sometimes you want to delete files, and here's where you want to be a little bit careful. So I can remove this directory by saying rmdir from 0 to n. And when I do that, it actually deletes the file. So if I show you my desktop again here, um, you can see that that, that folder is actually gone now. Now, uh, this is a little bit dangerous because Windows doesn't always ask you when you want, are you sure you actually want to do this? Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I always make absolutely sure that I, in fact, want to delete something before I run something that will delete anything. So use at your own risk, just be, be careful. Now, I will say, if I go ahead and make this directory again uh, from 0 to n, um, and we can see that it's back now, if there's a file inside that directory, I won't be able to delete it just like that. Um, and I'll show you what happens uh, just as an example. Um, but on a Mac, really quick, for those of you who are working from the Mac side, um, instead of rmdir, it's just rm from 0 to 1. Um, oh, is it not going to let me do that? I might need to rmr from, yeah. So um, that dash r is where you're going to get into a little bit of trouble, something recursively. That will not just remove the directory it will remove the directory and anything that is inside of that directory. And on a Windows computer, um, that rmdir won't work if there's something inside the directory. Apologies, I'm kind of repeating myself here. Let me go back over here. And so we may as well talk about how to create a file inside of a directory. So let's go inside from 0 to 1, or to n. And on a Windows computer, it's not quite as simple as on a Mac. Um, I can use the command echo, and then I can give it a little bit of information. Uh, I can say hello, and then I use the greater than sign, and then a file name, and I'm just going to call this echoed.py. Echoed 
So what will happen with echo is this is just a way of telling the terminal to repeat something back to me. Uh, and in this case, it's the string hello. We'll get into what strings mean maybe here today. The greater than sign is basically a pipe that sends that string into the file echoed, into the file echoed, okay? And so when I hit enter, now if I look at the directory here, we can see that there is a file called echoed.py. And if I go ahead and go into that file, and so let me go in here from 0 to 1. There's this file called echoed. I can double click it. And now you can see there is a string called hello inside this file. This is something I basically never do. I don't really, I don't really create too many files from the command line. But it, it can be a handy thing to do if you need to log information as you're running scripts or, or these sorts of things. Um, but not super, super useful for our purposes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close this. And we will go back over here to the terminal. And what I want to do now is I'm going to back out here. And now if I try to remove this directory called from 0 to n, uh, it tells me that the directory is not empty. If I want to remove everything inside the directory, all files, all subfolders, everything, I can say rmdir slash s from 0 to n. And then it will it'll try to remove it. It'll actually ask me if I want to, which is kind of nice. And I can say yes, and it removes it. And then we can see from our desktop that, in fact, uh, it's gone, right? You'll notice when I have this VS code up, um, oh, actually, that's this is something else. I already did that. Um, OK, so I'm going to go ahead and remake this, make dear from 0 to n. OK, and I'm going to cd in there, because this is where I'm actually going to be writing all of the scripts that we're going to be dealing with today. Um, oh, on a Mac, creating a file from the uh, command line is pretty simple. I'm going to make this directory again from 0 to n. You can just do uh, touch um, new file dot py. And then we can see that this new file exists in that folder. So if I open this up, we can see that this new file is in here. Now, on the Mac side of things, you don't actually need to give it a string or anything to put inside the file. It'll just create it from scratch for you. Um, but I will probably never, never come back to this going forward. So I think that is a useful, uh, is perhaps less useful than the other things. Let me check my notes to make sure I've talked about everything. OK, so those are all of kind of the general commands that um, I use on a daily basis. There are lots and lots of other commands. And I encourage you to familiarize yourself with how to use your computer's terminal, because it is going to be extremely, extremely useful. And I just did CLS there to clear off the screen. Now let's get into some Python specific commands from the terminal. Because if you'll remember, uh, in order to actually run a Python script, uh, we're going to need to invoke it. And we do that once you've installed Python with the Python command. Now, if you follow it with a file name, it will look for that file in your current folder, and it will run it if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it'll just say, hey, this is not a file. I don't know what, I don't know what you want from me, right? Um, but if you type Python just by itself and hit Enter, what will happen is it will open up the interactive interpreter. And you can see here that this is Python 3.8.5. This was last updated September 3rd, 2020. Um, and this is the most recent Anaconda distribution of Python. And you'll notice these three greater than signs on the left-hand side of my screen. This is what tells us that we are now inside of an interactive shell. And so we can you know, stick Python code in here. And when you're inside this interpreter, it will kind of echo back your most recent line at you. So you know, if we just put in numbers, it treats all of this 
like Python code, which is awesome. This is a really handy way. If you're not sure something uh, works in the way that you want it to, you can play around with it here. But often, when you first get into programming, you'll type Python and meant to type a file name, and you'll drop into this shell, and, and then it can be a little confusing on how to get out. If you want to quit it, you type quit with open and close parentheses. And when you do that, it will just drop you back into your command prompt, OK? So anything we do inside this Python uh, prompt here is going to be the same on Windows and Mac, generally speaking. There are sometimes a few differences here and there. But for the most part, we're going to be typing the same thing on Windows and Mac's com uh, Mac computers. Um, so let's say inside this directory, I have, well, let's make a Python file. Um, and I'm just going to create a new file here. And I'm just going to put in hello. And I'm going to save this as inside this folder as my first script.py. OK? Um, and if you don't want to do a string quite yet, you can just put 0, 15, 32. Uh, 2021. This is technically a perfectly valid Python file. So if I want to run this, oh, I am not showing you my, uh, <laughs> let me show you my code here. Um, let's go ahead and apologies. Let me make sure that I'm going to. I'm a little new with OBS, and it has lost my screen here. So there we go. Apologies about that. Um, I just created here. I went into new file, and then I saved it as my first script. I called it my first script.py. And then I just typed in 0, 15, 32, 20, 21. This is a perfectly valid Python script. It's really not going to do anything interesting. But it is still Python, right? Excuse me. <clears throat> so if I want to run this script, what I want to do is I want to go over to my terminal. And I'm going to check my directory to make sure it's there. And we can see that my first script is now listed in this directory. To run it, all I need to do is I need to type Python and then my first script. Uh, and apologies, I'm kind of in the way here. There we go. Um, and when I hit Enter, it will run that Python script. Now, you see it didn't say anything. And that's because this particular script isn't actually doing anything. Um, but it ran. Trust me on that. We'll be making some things that actually do some things here in a few minutes. Um, one other thing to know about is you can often add flags to your commands that will change how they run slightly. So one useful thing to do is if you use the dash i flag and then your file, your script name, it will run the script and then it will drop you into that Python interpreter. This is very, very handy for debugging your code uh, because if you run into an error in your code, it will drop you in right after that error occurred. So you can see, well, do these variables hold the information that I really um, think is useful? It's a very, very handy thing to know how to do. Um, but I'm going to quit that. Um, a few other shortcuts. If I press up on my keyboard, I can cycle through the commands that I've been running. Down goes to uh, the other way. right? So if you're running the same thing again and again, you could um, uh, do the exact same thing. Yes, so for Mac users, it's in fact exactly the same. Um, if you just type Python, it will open up your Python interpreter, and it will look basically exactly the same. Uh, you quit the same way, just like that. Um, over here, I don't have my, uh, let me open up my Visual Studio code, and I'll add to new file 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
no, I do not want to install Docker extensions. Um, and then to run it, I just say Python, uh, new file, and it will run it. So essentially, from, from this perspective, the, uh, the process is exactly the same. OK? Um, oh, one thing you might have noticed. Uh, this .py extension, so I call this new file .py. This is how the computer knows this is a Python file. When you save your first .py file with VS Code, it'll probably say, hey, do you want to install the Python extension? And I would go ahead and do that because it has syntax highlighting. It will kind of try to suggest to you uh, methods that it knows about. It's a really handy thing to have installed. Um, and so if it suggests that, it's up to you, but uh, I encourage you to try to use that. OK. Um, the last thing related to the command line that I wanted to talk about today is installing libraries for Python that don't come with Anaconda. So, And this will be the same for both Macs and for Windows computers. So. I am on my computer, and let's say I want to use some fancy functionality from a library that I don't have installed already. So uh, we'll, we'll go more into this as uh, the workshop goes on. But in order to load in extra functionality, you use the import keyword, and then you'll give it like a library name. So we're going to be using NLTK in this workshop. And it will, it will look for it, and it'll load it in if it's seen it before. And here, this one's installed. Um, but sometimes we'll find, oh, this library that I want to use, I don't have it installed yet. And I'm trying to think of one that I don't have installed here. Um, OK, for example, um, Spacey. This is a useful natural language processing library that we will be talking a little bit about that does not come with the default installation of Anaconda. So to actually install it, I need to be back in my regular command prompt. I cannot be inside Python itself. And I can use pip. Now, pip is a package manager that comes with Python that facilitates installing new things. So I just type pip install spacey. And then it will look for spacey, and then it will download it, and then once it's downloaded, it, it will ask me, do you want to go ahead and install this? And then I can say yes. Um, and so it, it'll, it'll take a moment, um, because my computer is doing lots of things at the moment. Um, oh, and in fact, it didn't actually ask. It just installed it. So it went ahead and installed uh, Spacey, as well as a number of other files that are handy uh, or that it needs to operate, right? And so now, when I go into Python and I try to import Spacey, it should work. Now, in some cases, if you don't own your computer, for example, if you're using your work computer, it might complain a little bit. It might say, hey, I don't have permission to do that. Um, and if that's the case, send me a message, and I'll kind of show you how to deal with that. Um, but hopefully that isn't a problem for any of you. If you actually managed to install Anaconda, you shouldn't have an issue. Um, there is another package manager that comes with Anaconda specifically called Conda. Uh, and it works pretty much the same way. You know, Conda installs Spacey. Um, either it won't know what I'm talking about or it'll be like, well, this is already installed, so we don't need to do anything. So I think those are all of the commands that you'll need to know to actually do what we want to do in this workshop. Um, it's 2.04, so maybe I should pause here for a moment and ask if there are any questions. Um, yeah, the Mac users, it's exactly the same for Python, which I showed a moment ago. Um, it's thinking about that anaconda command, or that conda command, which probably means that they don't have spacey in their, yeah, uh, they don't have spacey in their repositories. Um, yeah, any other questions? And then we're going to kind of start to get into 
the really, really super basic Python, and I'll tell you kind of what the basic data types are, uh, which is great because I wasn't even sure that we were going to have time to get to this today. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and in fact, I might need to make myself a cup of tea for a moment. Um, okay, so we haven't we haven't actually run any scripts yet, so we will we'll get to that um, in in a few moments. Uh, I'm just going to cancel this. Uh, sometimes, if your terminal just keeps running forever, you can use Command or Control C uh, on a Windows machine. And it's Control C on a Mac as well, and it will stop. I'm just going to stop that. Um, so let me switch back to my Mac, and we'll talk about that. So if you see here um, on this computer, I have this new file that I have saved in this from 0 to n folder. Um, what I can do is I can go into my terminal, and as long as long as I'm inside this from 0 to n folder, I can just type Python and then the name of that file to run it. And it'll just run. And like I mentioned, this script is not actually doing anything yet, so it won't look like it's doing much. Um, but it, it's working. So um, hopefully that's useful. I think I'm on a slight delay. And Hopefully that, that helps a little bit, uh, but please do let me know if it didn't, and we can try to figure out what the issue is. Um, I, I want to grab a little bit more water, and so I'm going to put you on just a very, very short break, and then we're going to come back and talk about really, really basic Python syntax. Okay? Uh, oh, the delay is only like five seconds. Okay, that, that's good. Um, uh, great to know. I okay so uh, just five minutes sorry well not even five minutes three minutes I'll be right back All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we've covered the terminal, and I think now is a good time to start to dive into really the most basic components of Python. Um, and I think I'm going to limit this uh, part of our discussion just to describing uh, basic data types 
how to create a variable and probably leave it at that for today because we've already covered a whole bunch of information and the more that I pile on to you, the more difficult this will be to remember. So what the plan is now is we're just going to start like we are starting a brand new project, okay? We've just opened up our terminal and we're going to go through all of the steps involved on both Windows and Mac computers, okay? So I will go ahead and I'm gonna delete this, um, this folder that I've created. Um, you don't have to, but I just wanna make sure every part of this process is really quite clear. So I'll just close this and minimize that. So I'm going to delete from 0 to n. Um, oh, it's in an open in another program. Yeah, I'll, I'll just have to close that completely then. Let's try again. Oh, actually. Oh, what's you? There's something using it, which is, all, oh, I see. <laughs> I'm in, I think that's the problem. Because I was in that folder in the terminal, the system thought it was in use. There we go. So now I can delete it without any trouble. And over here on my Mac, I want to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to quit this and make sure that is in my home folder. Okay, and so this is the state on my Mac of just opening up my terminal. I'm in my home folder. I haven't done anything at all yet. On the Windows side of things, um, I am going to be also in my home folder, which is just my users, uh, just like that. Okay, so here is where I am on this computer. So. I'm going to do everything on my desktop. Um, you're welcome to do all of this inside your home folder, but my first step is to change directories onto my desktop, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and make dir from zero to n. And we'll do the same thing over here on the Mac. I'll change directories onto my desktop, desktop. And I'll make directory from 0 to n. So same state, both computers over here on my, my Windows machine. I've never done this juggling back and forth, so hopefully this isn't just completely confusing. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cd into this folder, which is currently empty. And I will do the same thing here cd from 0 to n. So you can see that the commands are mostly the same, although they are not all completely the same. So if I list the contents here, we can see that there's not actually anything there. And on the Windows side of things, if I do dir, we can also see there are zero files. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to open my Visual Studio Code and let me, uh, OBS has forgotten about it again, of course. Uh, so properties, here we go. Okay, so I'm opening up Visual Studio Code and I am going to do a new file and I'm just gonna call this basic python.py and I'm just gonna make sure that I'm saving it in my desktop in this from zero to one folder. Okay, so basic python.py and I'm going to save it. Now, you're generally quite free to name your files whatever you think is most useful for your purposes. Just be careful, you don't want to name your files after other Python libraries. So for example, you wouldn't want to name your file math because then Every time you try to import math, it'll try to import your file and it'll just get very confusing. So if you have fairly long names for your files, that's great and you won't get things mixed up. Okay, so on Windows machine, we're in from zero to one. We have our basic Python file. 
We'll do the exact same thing over here on the Mac. And I open up Visual Studio Code. Um, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to save this as basic python.py. And I'm going to save it inside from 0 to 1, or 0 to n. And so now I should be all set. And I'll make this slightly larger as well. OK. So you can see here that it's in my desktop folder from 0 to n, basic Python. OK? So now I think we're ready to start actually writing a little bit of Python. Now, one of the most useful things to know about in Python is how to write a comment. So anything we put in this file, um, this is going to be interpreted by Python as Python code. So if I write, hello, my name is Paul, you can see a few things going on. You can see it trying to suggest a lot of Python syntax. Um, but also, it will highlight what it thinks is Python syntax. And is is, in fact, a keyword in Python. So if I save this, uh, this is not going, this is not valid Python code because it, there are a lot of reasons it's not, right? But if I want to make notes in my code so I remember what I'm doing, or if other people want to look at it, and kind of figure out what's going on, I want to be very, very clear about everything. So in order to do that, at the beginning of whatever I want Python to just kind of ignore, I'm going to add a hashtag, right? Or whatever you want to call it, a pound sign, an octothorpe. Basically, this is telling Python, anything that comes after this hash, just ignore. Right? And so this is one way of you know, adding notes. So for example, I could say the following function finds a word multiple times. Um, ha, ha, ha. You, know, you can add really whatever you want. Uh, but one really handy thing to do or to know in Visual Studio Code, if you highlight whatever, if you highlight text, and you press control slash, it will comment the code for you. If it's already commented, it will uncomment it for you. So in a lot of cases, if you're writing code and you don't want to delete it, but you don't want it to actually run temporarily, you can use this nice functionality to do that. Um, on a Mac, it's rather than control, um, slash, I think it's command slash. Let me test. Uh, yeah, on a Mac it is command slash uh, rather than control slash, okay? So comments, we want to always be very clear about what it is that our code is doing. So um, I'm just going to say super basic Python info. So Python has a number of very basic types of data that it handles in different sorts of ways. There are integers, and integers are simply whole numbers. So 0, 1, 12, uh, 85, 32, uh, negative 36, 35, 36 and so on and so forth. These are just whole numbers, right? Um, there, there are some nuances to them that we'll get to tomorrow, um, but these are integers. There's, there's not a whole lot going on here, um, but you know, it is what it is. Um, there are floating point numbers. These are decimal numbers, so 12.3, um, you know, 81.99999, uh, negative 12.4, and so on, right? Um, these are handled in memory in a different way than the integers are. One advantage of using integers is they're precise. Your computer can exactly represent 
any integer that will fit in memory. Floating point numbers are a little bit different because they can't be represented extremely precisely. So if you're doing complex mathematical calculations where extreme precision is important, you should avoid, as best you can, floating point numbers. So um, this is kind of one of those horror stories that they tell in like intro to computer science classes where people who are developing guidance systems in the 70s and 80s weren't super careful about their floating point numbers and they're forgetting that if we go off into kind of the decimal distance, uh, those numbers are a little wishy-washy and they will get more and more imprecise as calculations continue to happen. And so just be careful. Um, you know, for those of us who are working with textual materials, I mean, it's certainly not a life or death circumstance whether or not I miscalculate the rate of personal pronouns across, you know, science fiction novels written in the 1980s, you know, versus developing, say, systems that measure precise medication dosages, right? So just, just keep that in mind. So floating point numbers um, are, they're, of course, extremely useful, and you will uh, use them quite a bit, but, you know, just be aware of that. Um, another basic data type is the string. And the string is what we are perhaps most interested in in a class like this, because this is how we represent uh, language data, right? So Python knows something is a string if it is inside, excuse me, if it is inside quotation marks, right? And these can be either double or single quotation marks. Hello, my name is Paul. This is a string, and Python knows that it's a string because it started with this quotation mark. Now, VS Code is really handy. Uh, it's really nice. When I type a quotation mark, it actually provided a second one for me. Uh, this, this is usually pretty handy. Sometimes it can be a little frustrating when you don't want to do that, but it is what it is. Now, you can also specify a string with single quotation marks. So, hello, my name is Paul. These are functionally exactly the same. Um, there are some nuances in how Python handles double quotations versus single quotations, but none that really matter for our particular context. But be a little bit careful, because what happens when the string you're working with itself contains a quotation mark? So for example, if we want to say something like, um, hello. So I'll, I'll try to type this, um, but VS Code is going to fight me on it. So I'm going to say, hello. <laughs> hello, he said. Um, and so, for example, I want this to be clear that this is direct speech, right? Um, but because the Python interpreter doesn't know that this quotation mark should be inside the string, it treats it like Python syntax. So how do I avoid that? Well, one option is to simply use single quotes on the outside, right? If I change this to a single quote and this to a single quote, now we can see that it works just fine because Python knows, okay, I saw that single quote. To end it, I'm just going to look for another single quote. So in the midst of this, it's not it's not an issue at all. Um, another option, so let's say I do want to use those double quotes because that's you know how I am. I'm going to put this double quote here and this back here. I can actually tell Python, don't treat this as part of Python syntax with a backslash. And so if I add backslashes, this is basically saying, hey, Python, this is part of the string. This is not part of Python's own syntax. And so we're going to be doing a little, this is what's known as escaping a string. It's just saying, hey, this is a literal string and not 
something else. Um, the other thing, uh, and of course this also works the other way, um, let's say we have a possessive inside of a string. Um, uh, it was the church's car. So for example, in this particular case, this possessive, this apostrophe, is treated as Python syntax. So to avoid that, we can add a backslash. Simple enough. Of course, we could also have put this in double quotation marks to avoid this particular problem. Um, OK, so we're going to be delving really, really deeply into these strings next time, um, because this is going to really be our the thing we're going to be working with the most. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll really look closely at these. Um, there are, of course, other basic data types. Um, there are Booleans. Boo, I have no idea how to spell this. Boolean, Boolean. Uh, well, you get the point, Booleans. And Booleans are simply true and false. And <laughs> this Boolean logic is going to be how we are going to control the flow of our programs. Because in many cases, we're going to want to do one thing if something's true and do, <laughs> thank you, a Boolean with two O's. Um, we're going to do, want to do one thing if something's true and a different thing if something's false. And so these will be extremely important in how we, in how we deal with this. Okay. Um, there's another uh, data type, which is sort of a data type, uh, which is none type. Um, and that's just none. Um, this doesn't come up super often, but it is still a, an important thing. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, you can also check the type of a particular um, uh, you can check a object's data type pretty easily. I'll show you how to do that here in a moment. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk about variables. So you can actually do quite a bit of stuff in Python without the use of variables. But once you start using them, I mean, you're limiting yourself pretty significantly if you try to get away with that. With that. But uh, variables are basically how you tell Python to remember something. OK, so for example, uh, let's say um, I want to remember, hello, my name is Paul. Well, you know, if I want to use this five times, I can just do this five times. But this kind of defeats the purpose of programming. So what I want to do, well, I can say greeting equals, hello, my name is Paul, OK? So greeting is my variable. I tell Python that I am creating a variable and assigning a value to it with the equal sign. OK? And this will equal whatever thing I want to put inside of that. OK? There are some conventions to keep in mind when you are creating your variables. Because your variables can be whatever you want to call them within a few specific restrictions, right? I could call this x. But the problem is, let's say I'm way down here, and I've had lots of code, and I'm using x here, and I don't remember what does x do. Ideally, if I had called it greeting, I'd probably still have some sense of what this variable actually is doing. So the first thing to keep in mind is make your variables um, sensical, right? Make sure they make, they kind of tell you what they're holding. Um, and, you know, there's no real limit to the length of the variable names, except, you know, they can kind of get a little bit um, of a hassle to write as they get longer. The other thing to keep in mind is variables in Python must begin with a lowercase, well, they must begin with a letter, okay? So, for example, if I want to start it with one, um, you can actually see when I save this, 
that this is a syntax error and VS Code very handily underlines it and says this is invalid syntax. We don't really know what you're trying to do. Okay? So you can't start it with a number. Um, there are certain things that you can start it with, like an at sign, which changes its scoping. We're not going to get too much into that. Um, but you you can also you can start it with a capital letter. Uh, that's not breaking the syntactic rules, but it is breaking kind of the conventional approach to naming variables. So you should start with a lowercase letter. And sometimes you might want multi-word variables. And so either you can use, uh, so greeting from Paul, for example. I could just do it like this. I can't have spaces here because it won't know what to do with those spaces. Um, but I could use what's known as camel case with a capital F and a capital P just to make it a little more readable. Um, people do that. Uh, I kind of prefer having underscores between the different letters or the different words in my variable names. This is personal preference. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect how the, the program runs at all. Um, but once I've assigned something to a variable, then I actually no longer need to refer to this string, but instead I can refer to it by its variable. Okay? So maybe I want to print it. So let's say functions. So I'm going to introduce one more concept, and I think this will probably be the last concept we talk about today. I'll leave half an hour for questions. I'll hang out and chat. Um, but functions are essentially encapsulations of code that execute something in Python. So one very common thing to do is to print something. So if I, let's just actually save this code, and I'm going to go into my terminal, and I'll make sure you can see my terminal. Okay, I'm going to clear my screen. We'll look here. We can see we have our basic Python. To run this code, all I need to do is type python basic python.py and then hit enter. So this is going to be the same on a Windows machine and the same on a Mac. When I do this, it runs, it executes, but it actually doesn't show me anything, right? So sometimes it can seem like, oh, did it actually do anything? So one thing that we really often want to do is we want to print something to the terminal, okay? And so in order to do that, there is a function in Python. It will say functions execute some sort of command. And we'll talk about how to create our own functions uh, later in this boot camp. But one of the most common ones is print. Now, the way that functions work, you have the name of the function, and then you have parentheses. And inside these parentheses, you'll often give it information. Now, the print function is a built-in function that just says, take whatever variable is given to me and spit it out on the command line. So here, print greeting from Paul. Uh, you'll also note that um, VS Code has tab autocomplete. So it suggests, I think, this might be something you want to use. I hit tab. It fills it out. So now, now that I have this print statement in here, if I go back to my terminal and I press up to put the command there and I run this, now it says, hello, my name is Paul, on the command line, right? So people will often use print statements to debug the code that they're working on. Um, there, there are, of course, more sophisticated ways to go about that, but this is one of the really common uses of the print function. And we'll often use it to make sure that our code is telling us, hey, I'm still working if we're doing something that takes a long time. It's a very, very useful function. Um, so let's jump back over here to the code. So I'm printing greeting from Paul. Um, let's also say um, one, um, let's say, a number. And this is just 120, right? OK, so we have a number here. Um, or I could call this my number, whatever. 
I can also print my number, okay? Um, one thing that I should say about variable names is avoid naming your variables after reserved words in Python. And I know this is tough when you don't know any Python yet, but fortunately, a lot of keywords in Python are going to be highlighted by your code editor. So here I'll say avoid naming after, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking a lot, after reserved <coughs> words. So for example, list is a reserved word. You can see how it's turned green here. It might be different in your, uh, excuse me, <coughs> frog in my throat. Uh, it might be different on your computer, the color it makes it. But if I say list equals hello, Python will not stop me from doing this. So I can print, I can print list, but this becomes a problem. And so I'll, I'll run this. It's, you see it says, hello, my name is Paul, 120, and hello. This works, uh, sorry, let me show you. Here's the terminal. Hello, my name is Paul, 120, hello. As you might imagine though, lists will be extremely useful for us in this bootcamp. If I try to actually create a list now, um, let's say list um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I'll call this my new list, and I try to print this, my new list, it's going to break. It's going to say type error, let's see terminal. Uh, so I'll, oops, sorry, I'll clear this off. I'll run this. It runs, but then it eventually breaks. And you can see that it's telling me that on line, one for, on line 41, when I try to create a list, object is not callable, right? We'll get into what this is, should be doing later, uh, but just know that if you're running around naming, using, um, if you're running around using reserved words as your variable names, you're going to break your code. So I would say, you know, don't do that. Another thing is, is avoid saying things like my list equals a string. Again, this is not something that Python is going to fight you about, um, but it is going to be confusing for you later when you're like, well, why is my list a string? Okay. Uh, so just be, be careful uh, along that. Um, oh, the last thing I want to show you is the type uh, function. There is a function. If you're not sure what is living inside of a variable or what variable object type it is, you can actually use the type function in Python to check. So let's say I don't remember what is in this my number uh, this my number variable. Um, so we'll clear that off. What I can do to figure this out is I can just print type my number. So note that this will get a little visually confusing as you start nesting things. And, and this is why R is so beautiful in how the tidyverse has done things where they've developed these nice little pipes that feed your data from one stage into the next because nesting things like this can look a little weird. But the way this works is I have this variable called my number and my number equals 120. I'm checking its type. So type takes my number and it will return to me whatever that data type is. And then in turn, this will feed into the print function to show it to me on the terminal, okay? So when I run this, and oh, well, one thing that I haven't been super consistent about showing you, um, make sure you save your file constantly. So you'll need to go to File, Save, or use Control S. And this is actually one of the biggest hangups, I think, for a lot of people when they first get started, is you type a bunch of code and then you run it and it doesn't seem like anything changed at all. Often it's because you've accidentally not saved it. <laughs> Excuse me. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, 
So if I print type my number and I go ahead and run basic, I go ahead and run Python, basic Python, we can see that we have, hello, my name is Paul, 120 class int. So it is telling us, hey, this is an integer. Um, but do note that if, for example, I have 120, but I put it inside quotation marks, it is no longer an integer. It has now become a string, right? So I will go ahead and run this again, and I'll show you my terminal here. I ran it again, and you can see that now 120, oops, um, you can see that now 120 isn't an integer, it's a string. But you couldn't actually tell that visually from the command line because up here, um, 120 is still an integer, uh, but it, it kind of looks the same. So this is a useful way if you've kind of forgotten what a data type a particular variable is. Um, I think that's probably going to be it for today. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and I realize I have hit you with a whole lot of material. I will put this file up on the, the GitHub page so you can take a look at it there. You can download it, uh, play around with it, uh, make sure you can run it. And then next time we're going to start talking about actually doing things with this, right? So we'll talk about string functions. We'll talk about addition, multiplication. We'll talk about a little bit about Boolean logic, I imagine, and we're going to kind of see how far we get, right? Um, my, my hope is, is that by Wednesday we can get into actually working with texts and actually doing some, some analysis of them. Um, but this is a step-by-step -step process, and the real key is practice playing around with things and making sure that you remember it. Because one of the hard things is this does require a lot of attention to detail because typos will be the bane of your existence. Um, and it's, I, I don't have great attention to detail. I, I just have a lot of willingness to bang my head against the wall for a long time. Um, and sometimes it comes down to that. But my hope is you won't have to uh, and that we'll be able to you know, get you somewhere where you can do some real cool things with this stuff. So yeah, with that, let's um, we'll call it there, and we will. Uh, um, I'll stick around for like 15 minutes to see if folks have any questions, and then we're gonna pick this back up at one tomorrow. Um, all right, and thanks everybody so much for joining. Um, I really hope this will be useful for you, and uh, you know, yeah, it's you know I'm always you can always reach out to me on Twitter on, you know, via email if you have further questions as well. Okay? Uh, and enjoy your afternoon. Uh, hopefully it's not, the weather's not bad wherever everybody is. So, but yeah, hit me up with any questions you have. Um, and um, yeah, enjoy your afternoon. And I, I have mentioned this, but I will be posting this on YouTube. And also, I guess if there aren't any questions now, um, we can uh, I can answer them kind of at the beginning of tomorrow as well. Um, just because, yeah. I do have a tendency of going on longer than I should, so you should always feel free to pipe up in the chat and let me know if there are questions. Um, as far as the codes, um, 
As far as the colors in code, if they're different, no. I don't think you'll you're you've messed anything up. Um, what it um, I don't know exactly why it does different colors on different people's computers, but it is that is just what it is. I was trying to type out my answer, but then I realized, well, I'm on video. I can just answer directly. Um, if you've created a variable but accidentally used the wrong type, is there a way to convert it without creating an entirely new variable? Yes, definitely. Um, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, that's known as um, type coercion, um, and it, it's really simple. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about how to do it tomorrow. But for example, if you have a string but you want it to be an integer, you would simply do something like this. So if we see here my number equals 120 is a string, um, what I can do is I can just say my number equals int my number. But we'll talk more about this um, as we get further along uh, tomorrow. And we'll also talk about this kind of funky syntax where we have a variable being saved to itself. This basically just overwrites what previously was in my number. Yeah, the, the themes in uh, VS Code are completely editable. I, d I didn't think I had changed mine, but it's entirely possible that at some point I did. It's also an older installation of VS Code, and they may have changed the default uh, colors in some way. All right, well, I guess if there aren't any further questions, um, we can pick this up again tomorrow, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I will monitor the, um, the comments on the live stream if people have questions later and try to answer those either in the comments or when we come back tomorrow.